to welcome all of you back to Ohio Exopolitics. I'm your host, Mark Snyder. We're going to be talking about the Billy Meyer case today. Uh, the first hour, we're going to talk about reincarnation, the creation, as Billy calls it. Uh, then we're going to discuss the creational nat natural laws. The final topic for the first hour will be Billy's book called The Might of Thoughts. And then the second hour, we're going to get into Billy's early life of easy intelligences, the, the Way to Live book, and a little bit about Atlantis. So I'll try to work in a little bit of general information about Billy for those who are not aware of who Edward Albert Meyer is. Billy Meyer, he's about 81 year, years old. He lives in a tiny mountain village in Switzerland, actually just behind a tiny mountain village. Uh, he lives in a place called Hinter Schmidruti. Hinter is behind Schmidruti is the small little village in northern Switzerland among the snow-capped mountains and the green pine forests of Switzerland. Billy's written about 50 books. He has a group called the FIGU. There's a group in Canada, FIGU Canada. There's a uh, FIGU in Switzerland, which is the, the main group. There are various unofficial groups in the United States, uh, FIGU Australia, I believe, and I believe there's one in Japan. There's a fellow in Canada called Michael Udibrook, who has done a really fantastic movie on reincarnation. It's called Reincarnation in the Spirit Form. So we're going to talk uh, for at least for 15 minutes about, about reincarnation as it's taught by the Billy Meyer material. In order to evolve, something called the creation creates what's called the human spirit form. Now, the creation is the superintelligence that formed our universe. It's, it's, this intelligence is not a personality. We have the notion of God on Earth, which is a very incorrect idea. The, the real intelligence that's behind our universe has no personality in the way we think of a personality. It's, it's not a father figure. It's not a mother figure. It is what's called a Wesenheiten in the German, and it, and it evolves according to this fixed pattern. It has no personality. And this is another thing that's hard for us to understand. This this intelligence radiates love, and we always equate love and a personality. So it's kind of hard for us to wrap our minds around something which generates love that really has no personality. So to understand this idea called the creation is kind of challenging to us. But... We're going to get to the creation in the next 15 minutes, but I wanted to focus on this idea of reincarnation because everyone has something called the spirit form. Not only do you have a spirit form, but plants have a spirit form, animals have a spirit form, and the human spirit form comes into the body of a child and a child, at this point, I'm talking about a child that's 21 days old, so it's more of an embryo. And the spirit enters into the area called the superior colliculus. And when it enters in there, it's like a light switch going off because it brings in the new consciousness. And the heart starts to beat. And something called the psyche is then active in the body. The psyche is the half material, half physical part of your material consciousness. It, the psyche, controls the thoughts and the feelings of the material consciousness. You see, you have a spiritual consciousness and a material consciousness. The material consciousness is new each lifetime. The spiritual consciousness 
isn't completely awake. It's not completely conscious in the way that you and I and our material consciousness is, is conscious. The, the spirit form, the spiritual consciousness, it is focused on getting the purest information and absorbing the purest information. You see, the spirit form evolves independently through the human being's material consciousness. And this universal intelligence, this creation, creates spirit forms. And they evolve independently. And the, the creation is kind of observing this going on. So prior to entering into the human being, for the first time, the spirit form is it's totally neutral. It's in a timeless existence. And the goal of the spirit form is to collect wisdom and knowledge through these countless reincarnations. We reincarnate into physical bodies for millions and millions of years. I think it's 40 to the first 40 to 60 million years of our life, we are reincarnating into a physical body and then dying and then spending a certain amount of time in the other world in the in the fine matter world there's an energy band around the planet where the spirit form goes to after death and it takes with it the the consciousness from the previous life so this cycle of life and death and life and death and life and death goes on and on and i saw this cycle take place today this morning uh, i got up kind of late i was really tired and i let my cats out and I have six cats, and I let my cats out of the garage at about 10 a.m., and they were hanging out being really cool. I, I love it when they do that. Nobody was running too far away from home or anything. But this gigantic flock of birds came in, man, from somewhere, and they were just everywhere, and the racket was incredible. And, you know, the cats are like, oh, boy, birds, you know. I want to get a bird. And... um the father cat took off first to try to get one of these birds and i clapped my hands several times and yelled and this robin finally got enough sense to leave he came within a few feet of losing his life well my my little guy the peach colored orange tabby he uh, he took off and he got a bluebird before i could do anything about it so I saw the cycle of life and death again. So we have this, this cycle of life and death that goes on here on the earth. And unfortunately, there's a lot of unnecessary death, which is what I, I saw this, this morning again. And I call this many times the planet of unnecessary death. And if you see it on the road, there's so much roadkill today, especially if you live in an area where there's deer or raccoons and other animals you'll see a lot of unnecessary death and i think we're going to see more and more of that as we continue our population increasing and i've seen a lot of the utility companies that are cutting down a lot of trees in this area beautiful beautiful trees that i always enjoyed driving past and seeing and it's 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 difficult to have to see this sort of thing so this the 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 plants have a spirit form as well so they'll die their spirit form will probably also cycle into the 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 realm of this fine matter world and come back now i don't i don't know exactly the whole story with the evolution of plants plants have what's called the mire material an impulse evolution where we as human beings are are giving what's called our conscious our consciousness is evolving so we have this material consciousness in the human brain and it personifies the functions of decision making all thought processes, speculations, all actual thinking is a part of the material consciousness. 
And in everything in our thinking, everything that goes on in our material consciousness is ordered to the law of evolution. And I was just talking about the creation. I wanted to quote to you something that's in one of Billy's writings. It's called The Goblet of Truth. And it's if you get that big book, you can download it for free. Just go out and search for Billy Meyer, Goblet of Truth. And then you, you'll download a big PDF, and then you can search for and try to find. And it might take a couple tries because the it's case sensitive, I think, and it searches. It's There's a paragraph that's entitled, What the Truth Knows to Say. And Billy sums up this whole reincarnation very, very interestingly, he says that rivers, stones, plants, bushes, trees, everything that crawls and flies on the earth is a life form with a spirit form. And these spirit forms are on a journey through time which involves many, many lifetimes. And death is just the passage into the world of pure spirit. And many of these creatures are aware of one another. And they're connected by what are called the psychic swinging waves. And I saw it again this morning where hundreds of birds, when I was telling my cat story, landed in the trees behind my house. And the racket was incredible. It lasted for hours. And snap a finger they all left at the same time i have no idea why they all were able to suddenly leave together but they're connected you see by these psychic swinging waves which is fascinating and, and the the human mind also has what are called the swinging or i can't pronounce it probably correctly but the swinging wave and our swinging wave associated with each human being, the analogy I would draw, and I didn't read this in Billy's book, but the way I think of it is that when you throw a pond, when you throw a, a pebble into a pond, there's a wave that goes out. Now, if two waves come together and they resonate with one another, they amplify each other. If they don't resonate with one another, then there's, uh, they cancel each other out. So what is happening today all over the earth is we're seeing the, the swinging wave of all these people and their thoughts. And like as I'm speaking now, I'm emitting swinging waves, these swinging waves, and they will come across to people also that are thinking along the same wavelengths or maybe have started to think along the same wavelengths. And the thoughts that I'm putting out through reading Billy's material and sharing it with you will start to amplify your thoughts and they will resonate with one another. And this is how from what I can see, we're going to affect change in the world because it's very critical that we start to change. And what has to change is our understanding of what the creation is. And it's what Sfoth, Billy's first mentor, told Billy. He said the biggest, biggest problem with the earth humans is that they don't understand creation. And then, then Svath went on to say something very interesting about everything being one and it being all bound together. I never understood exactly what he was saying. But as the years and years go on, I'm starting to appreciate this more and more. Uh, the creation is not a man standing in judgment. The creation is genderless. It is the source of everything. The creation, our universe, 
is about 46 trillion years old. And 46 trillion years ago, the creation experienced something called the Big Bang. You know, creation creates galaxies, stars, human spirit forms during its expansion phase. And this expansion phase lasts about 155 trillion years. So these are, these are time periods that we can't even imagine. So I think in the next section, we're going to study a little bit about creation. Yeah. Um, the creation is our visible universe, okay? Um, but it's more than that. You see, our visible universe is only one of seven belts of creation. And the entire universe is like a double spiral, like the, the double helix of the human um, genes. Well, creation is a double spiral, and it's egg-shaped. And our universe is def divided, divided into these seven belts, or you could call them rings. Okay, these rings, they're, they're rotating against each other, and they have different diameters, and all of it's kind of an ovoid shape. Starting from the very center of creation is what's called the central core. And then you go out into something called the Ur core belt. And then something called the third belt is called Ur space. Now this is getting interesting. The energies of Ur space are positive and they flow into the next belt, which is the fourth belt, the material belt. So you see these positive energies flowing in to the solid state matter universe belt. Now the solid state matter universe belt, the fourth belt of our universe is where all the matter exists, the planets, the suns, the galaxies, the, the comets, the gases, the meteors, the dark matter. Uh, so the positive energy from the Earth space belt meets the negative energy coming in from the transformation belt. So matter has a negative and a positive energy. Well, this is one of the creational natural laws is that there's always a, ne uh, a negative and a positive. Okay, and it says in the Might of Thoughts that the negative and the positive are two forces which belong together because they depend on one another. So if you ever try to separate the negative and the positive in your life, you're going into what's called a sartung in the German. Or, or you're, you will go out of control. It's a creation on natural law. You will lose your control. You will become uh, unhappy. You will be angry probably whenever you try to separate the negative and the positive. So if you have a negative in your life, you have to accept it and work with it. It doesn't mean that you don't try to solve the problem, but you cannot get rid of it. You see, the negative is a part of the negative and the positive that are working together. Now, I could tell uh, several stories here. But I'm going to have to hold back a little bit Otherwise, I'll go too off, far off target because we're talking about the solid matter universe belt, which has both negative energy that comes from the transformation belt and positive energy from the earth space belt. But there's a whole bunch of analogies that you can go over in the book called The Might of Thoughts, which we'll get to at the end of the first hour. But um, so the earth space belt then which is the, th the third belt, uh, meets with the negative energy that's coming from the transformation belt. And this forms 
the course material in the material belt. The negative energy from the transformation converts also into other energy forms, which I have not taken good enough notes on all of this. It gets complicated. The positive energy from the Earth space belts also converts into other energy forms. Technically, it is other energy forms that form the material belt. Okay, just, but it all starts with the negative and the positive coming together, but there are other energy forms involved. Now, the, the matter in the material belt is only about 45 billion years old. Even though our universe is 46 trillion years old, the matter will never be older than about 45 billion years. Now, just to kind of let you know, and something I was contemplating this morning as I was listening to all these birds and sitting on the back porch with all, well, I think at one point I had all six cats on the back porch, and I'm just listening to this cacophony of bird noises. I've never heard so much. I mean, louder than, louder than it is in Switzerland at Billy's. There's just birds, birds, birds everywhere. So I'm thinking to myself that we have a solid state matter universe belt. And I was thinking that in higher forms of creation, there is no material, which always puzzles me and always seems very strange to me that you could have a universe with, I guess, nothing but energy, I'm guessing. Anyway. So we've covered the first four belts of, of creation. Well, in the fifth belt uh, is where we have the transformation belts. And in the transformation belt, you have something called chronons uh, and tachyons. And the tachyons, these deal with time. I don't know that much about it yet but there are tachyons and chronons in this transformation belt. And this has to do with time, okay? So there's also time in our universe that's going on along with these seven belts. Now the sixth belt is the creation belt. It's called the expansion belt sometimes. And then you have the final belt, which is called it's just the last layer of our universe. So those are the seven belts of creation. Now, creation goes through many, many, many different cycles of evolution. And uh, Michael Uderbrook, again, from Figu Canada, who I've got to get back on the show, has a movie somewhere if you search for it you'll find it on YouTube I think it's rather brief really if I remember correctly it's only about 10 or 15 minutes but it's so profound it's a it's a brief description of what are called the wake and sleep cycles of creation uh, remember creation is not a god or a father figure it has no gender. Now, it's both positive and negative in complete equality. The creation is neutral. Its power and wisdom is the greatest in, in, in our universe. So, the creation must continually evolve. And this is one of the laws of the universe as well. This is one of the creational natural laws that we'll probably talk about next for the next 15 minutes or so, but I want to finish up on creation because we have to continuously evolve. Plants have to continuously evolve, trees, everything. And our creation is bound to the laws of what's called the Ur creation, which is a higher power of consciousness. <laughs> so there's a higher universe than ours called the earth creation and this earth creation 
played a role in the creation of our universe. It had an idea. And that led to the creation of our universe and the Big Bang. And I don't know exactly how much of it that is the Earth creation versus our creation. So our universe is evolving into an Ur creation. And there are 10 to the 24th power steps between the initial creation and to something called the absolute absolutum, which is the highest form of a creation. Uh, and so we have our universe, which is bound to the laws of what's called the Ur creation. And then we have something called the absolute absolutum. And the Ur creation is bound to these laws of a higher might and consciousness, again, called the absolute absolutum. And the power of the absolute absolute impulses through all creation forms. So, our creation, our universal consciousness, is the power and might for all, all life in our entire universe. The creation is the planets and the stars, all the flora and fauna on Earth come from the creation and the creation is pulsing in all life and even in death you see death is is just another dimensional form of life but the creation is existing and it's pulsating with all life and and our creation is the lowest form of all creations it has what's called the lowest swinging waveform. Remember earlier I was talking about the birds moving as a unit and that they, ha they have a swinging wave and they're connected by psychic swinging waves. Well, there's this swinging wave in our universe. You know, uh, what, a kind of a side tangent here. Uh, we're talking about the creation, but repetition is so important because I've, I've studied this material before and try to be stand back for a minute and observe your own consciousness as you're studying. And I can tell when I'm studying something like, and I'm getting it. Okay. As I'm speaking to you, I'm getting this, but I've read this many times before <laughs> where I didn't get it so well. So step back a little bit. Why, if you study this material, and I hope you all eventually do study this material too, because I think our, our survival depends on it. But step back, because your first time through this, you might only get like a teaspoonful. And the second time through, you'll get a tablespoonful. And the third time through, you might get three tablespoons or something to that effect. So each repetitive time you go through, you learn it. So it may seem a little bit overwhelming at first. And I can kind of feel at time my own consciousness shutting down. Like, whoa, too much information. I, I, can't, pulse, I can't process all of this. Uh, but hang in there because over time, uh, this will become more it'll become very stimulating for you actually if you can stick with it. So our creation has a lowest swinging waveform. It is the least old and the least developed of all creation forms. And that's another thing I was contemplating today while I was uh, listening to the birds and watching the interchange between the birds and the cats. And something was going on in creation this morning. Maybe it had to do with insects and birds following insects. I don't know. It was really bizarre, but it was quite bizarre and interesting. And that's what I think you'll find is stuff on the creation is quite bizarre and interesting at the same time. Well, again, the creation is the universal consciousness. And our universe is creation's internal and external body. The German word for creation is Schopfung. 
And the universe that we live in is the material manifestation of the wisdom of the universal consciousness. Everything which exists in the whole universe is a manifestation of the might and the infinite and true love of our mighty universal consciousness in this now. I talk about the love of creation quite a bit because it's a fascinating and awesome thing. You see, love is the highest principle in our creation. And through it, everything exists in absolute logic. Every tiny plant and every tiny animal fulfills its purpose in love. And love will forever be the purpose of our existence. Now, one shocking and bizarre on the surface of things, contradiction is the predator-prey relationship, like I saw this morning again, where one of my cats killed a bird, beautiful bluebird, such a horrible thing. Um, you know, and then the cat takes off running now. Good luck catching a cat that has a bird in its mouth. It ain't going to happen. Let me tell you. I tell, I'll tell you now. You, I've had... It, anyway, I digress. But creation radiates love. But at the same time, there's this... In our first level of creation here, there's this weird predator-prey relationship. And how this all works together, I don't know yet. I'm still learning, as we all are. But love, you can eventually, if you observe creation enough, you will sense the radiating love of creation. Creation has an infinite love and an effective love. And the incredible splendor of nature is the visible expression of the love of creation. So when you're in nature and you see this incredible beauty, you're seeing the love of creation. That's a visible expression of the love of creation. And creation has what are called the creational natural laws, which I'll probably talk about for the next 15 minutes. And some of these laws, including the law of love, which I was just talking about, the love of creation, which is such a phenomenal thing. Uh, this is the highest form of love, the love of creation. It's also called effective love. And our true love is very much like creation's love. It's, it's based on respect and admiration and veneration. It's very permanent. It's very stable. Just the opposite of romantic love. The world emphasizes romantic love, which leads to disappointment. Always, I think. Be very careful in, when you're involved in romantic love because it, it can be very dangerous. Um, it can trigger emotions which lead to manslaughter and murder at times. So be very wary of romantic love. But this is not romantic love. We're talking about the law of love and the highest form of love, uh, the radiating love of creation, or the love that's based on respect and it's based on veneration. That's the first creational natural law. The second law is the law of striving. It's the fundamental law of evolution. That's your purpose in life is striving to evolve your consciousness. So if you didn't know your purpose in life, that's your purpose. The evolution of your consciousness. And without striving, there is no life. Well, there's a book... And I believe it's in the Way to Live book here. And on page 102, and I've been uh, reading in the Way to Live book, and maybe I will go off on a tangent here here, in a second. But um, striving creates the life right up to the being. Striving means delectation. Delectation is satisfaction. In a form which is always fulfilling, to be without striving means unwillingness and affliction. Affliction, when you experience affliction, 
It's because you may have inhibited striving. So look at your life, reevaluate yourself. Am I not striving? And you will have to strive really, really hard at times. And so you must be willing to do that. Inhibited striving leads to um, stagnation, grief, confusion, irrationality, joylessness, cognitionless, a lack of peace, internal disharmony, lovelessness, resentment. But get back to work because all aspects of striving, some are more advanced, where you're learning that like this material that we're talking about now. That's part of striving. But there's also just cleaning up your garage, which is also an aspect of striving. And there's I also want to bring and up um, a little thing called fulfilling your duty to yourself. And I think that's probably related to striving. Fulfilling your duty to yourself is where you're, you're taking care of yourself. You're, you're taking the time to, you know, brush your teeth and trim your beard and take a shower and, and these kind of things. But you're also, you're not, you're not judging yourself. You're being your own best friend. And this is, I think, related to the law of striving, fulfilling your duty to yourself. Um, let me read a little bit about fulfilling your duty to yourself. Here it says, Then he or she disregards his or her consciousness and prefers to run far away to where the inner and well-meaning voice of his or her own consciousness is shouted down by the roar and the tumult of those seeking enjoyment and so forth. Human being, whoever and whatever you are, constantly guard yourself against neglecting or even disregarding or disowning your best and truest and closest friend, thus namely yourself with whom you are closest always and for all times. Therefore, never neglect yourself and esteem your own friendship to yourself. Be caring, open, and honest towards your inner friend, to yourself and to your own I. Constantly concern yourself with never turning your back on yourself and thus neither on your inner friend who you certainly always need. So the law of striving is related to the law. Another principle is fulfilling your duty to yourself, which means you are your own best friend. And this is related to the law of striving because you will have to continue to strive. Pay heed that this friend does not just turn away from you because you are in dire need of this friend. Therefore, be constantly on guard. Because again and again in the life, there arise situations and moments which quite especially require of you that you remain true to yourself and to your inner friend. There are situations and moments which quite especially bring the requirement that you do not abandon yourself even when everyone else abandons you. Okay, this is, I bring this up related to the law of striving because there are going to be times when you have to strive so intensely just to survive. So keep that in mind. The third creational natural law, and we'll be talking about the creational natural laws for the next five minutes or so. Um, the law of harmony. And this is all related to the Might of Thoughts book, The Law of Harmony, and I was talking about this in terms of the creation earlier, that there's a bipolar structure. In everything, there's a positive and a negative. So your thoughts need to be neutral positive. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if you have neutral positive thoughts, you'll be fulfilling the Law of Harmony. So that means you have slight negative inclusions at times in your positive thinking. Now, I say this 
and I almost want to bite my tongue because we live with thousands of negative thoughts. We have constantly repeating negative thoughts and you need to learn to kind of stop this pattern of negative thinking. Negative thinking will cause you great grief. You will bring in negative experiences into your life. And we live, you know, you've heard of a placebo. Well, I think there's something called the, the nocebo. The placebo is where you take a sugar pill and you're healed. Not by the sugar pill, but you're healed by your own healthy thinking. Again, we're talking about the law of harmony. But the nocebo is where you're made sick by your own negative thinking. You're made weaker by your own negative thinking. So I always repeat to myself, I am confident, I'm optimistic, I'm relaxed, I'm cheerful, I'm enthusiastic. Billy in his book, The Might of Thoughts, has a section on confidence optimism, on being relaxed, on being cheerful. Because this is one of the laws of creational natural laws is that you always need to be in harmony internally, even during difficult circumstances. This is a real challenge because your material consciousness is going to want to get rid of the negative, the irritating, whatever's there always is an extra thing that comes up when you're, when you're evolving. There's always this other thing that's going to jump up and get in, in a way of your evolution and get in the way of the law of harmony. And this is a great, great difficulty. Um, there is another law. If you can keep up the law of harmony, if you can continue to have the law of harmony in your life and have neutral positive thoughts. You'll bring in the positive circumstances in your life. Your good thoughts will lead to good feelings. Your good thoughts and good feelings or you'll have good habits and then you'll have good circumstances come into your life. And It's good to take inventory and think about things that have happened in your life. I can think of several things within the past month or two where I think the might of my thoughts have conquered difficult problems and brought in uh, good circumstances. Now, life will continue to bring you challenges. So let me give you an example of a negative inclusion. I started this with a negative inclusion. I'm doing good work in my day job, but I know life always brings challenges and things will become difficult. And this is an example of a neutral positive thought that has a bit of a negative inclusion. And the negative inclusion creates the balance. You know, you can go over positive and become what's called a sarton or out of control of the good human nature. So if you stay in the law of harmony and recognize that there's a bipolar structure to everything that exists, a positive and a negative, you can continue to move forward. And you'll have a, eventually the law of prosperity and abundance. Well, we are quite fortunate because if you have the Meyer material and you're able to apply it, you can continue in the law of um, harmony, the law of prosperity and abundance. And this will continue and make things good in your life. I'm going to send a little message to my producer if he's there. See if he can come on the air. I'd like to... I don't know if he's still listening. He might have walked away. But, um... Okay, let me bring... I'm going to bring on Stephen Woods. And I'm going to actually have to split just for a second. <laughs> I'm having a bit of a dog issue right now. And, uh, oh, isn't life wonderful? Okay, S let me bring Stephen on. Stephen, I'm calling him right now. 
Uh, I'm gonna have to let one of my dogs out here. Uh, we're we're in we're in real life here. Stephen, are you there? I am. Sir, please take over for me. I know you're very qualified. Just read if you have to for ten minutes or five minutes. I'll be back. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Well, how's everybody doing today? This kind of hits me at a unnoticed, so I'm not quite sure what to cover here, but we'll see. Mark me caught me at a loss here because I didn't really have my books out, so bear with me just for a second. I'm back. Sorry about the dead air, Mark, but I didn't have a whole lot to go on right now. And, oh. uh, I had to get my book, so I apologize. <laughs> was, there dead, was there dead air the whole time? Uh, there was. I'm sorry, but yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad you came on anyway. Uh, sorry. <laughs> oh, I did put you on the spot. Um, well, we'll have to deal with dead air. What the hell? Hey, uh, what's that? Yep. I have a dog who's he's getting way up there age-wise, and I have to take him out right when he... When he says he's got to go, he's got to go. So it's that's just the way it is. Um, and he may have to go again. He doesn't seem to be done. So I was talking about the the might of thoughts. Well, see, this goes right into the negative. See, <laughs> it, it always happens, man. I'm telling you. It's, there you go. It's like clockwork. Whenever I'm getting to a new level of understanding, and Billy talks about that. It, I swear, it always happens. You made me so, sweat today, see? <laughs> <laughs> Did it? That's okay. Ah, uh, well. So, yeah, how's your study of the mind material? Is it coming okay? Or? Yeah, very good, yeah. I had a little uh, side tangent at work, and uh, uh, in my off time or my breaks, I was reading uh, a book called uh, Four Agreements, which uh, I think I sent you a little uh, clip on how it was similar to uh, Billy's oh, yeah. information there. Yeah, so I finished up that book. and Is that a good book? I really liked it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, cool. it's a, some very uh, it's easy read and uh, some uh, principles that are uh, easy to put into practice too. So yeah, it's really good. It, is it really similar to? Is that the one that was similar to the Might of Thoughts or just the introduction? The uh, okay. the story that he gave. You know, the the smoky mirror. I think it's called. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's uh, that's different. Mm hmm. That's very very different. Yeah. But some of the principles, you know, go very similar to what Billy teaches too, yeah. So hmm. I um I go through periods where I feel like I'm accelerating and then periods I was talking about that earlier in the show. When I, I'm reading the stuff and I just man, I just something in the back of my mind is telling me, you know, you're not really getting this. <laughs> And uh, sometimes I just have to stop reading because I, I know I'm not absorbing for whatever, for whatever reason. But I was reattracted to um, the whole fulfilling your duty to yourself thing with, um, you know, the book, The Way to Live. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, is, is something that I neglect. Uh, if I look at my life... Uh, I fulfill. I, f I feel like I neglect fulfilling my duty to myself, and I could, you know, 
name a few things. I don't know if it's a positive thing to do or not. But, um, you know, I just think it's real easy for me to to neglect that. Um, and the duty to yourself. I mean, it's he when he defines duty to yourself, he's also talking about being kind and benevolent. Mm-hmm. Which I, I, I wouldn't think of fulfilling a duty to yourself. I mean, I, I th- I've, I've, I'm going to have to go, man. Go ahead and read if you have to. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, uh, I'll be back. All right, not a problem. Uh, just one of the things in the four agreements I thought was interesting was taking this inventory, mental inventory of what we hold as truths for our lives. Uh, so anything that we believe is going to affect us. Um, it affects you know, if, if we believe that we're uh, intelligent or we believe that we're uh, not intelligent, that's going to have ramifications in our lives. So these things that we believe, uh, if we hold them as truths, if they're not true, they're going to have ramifications in our life. And I think you're back, Mark. I think I hear you. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm glad. Go ahead. I, I just caught the back end of what you were talking about. Yeah, not a problem. Uh, so, so the book, one of the things it brought out was taking an inventory of yourself, okay, and what you hold as truths. Because if you're believing in something that isn't truth, it's going to have results, right? So <laughs> if you believe that you're not intelligent, well, that's going to have uh, an effect in your oh. life. No, this is the other book you were talking about. Right, right, right. And how it ties into what Billy was talking about, too, you know, as far as um, the truth that he, that he discusses. So that's what I love about the spiritual, spiritual teaching is that you, know, you can just evaluate it for yourself and apply these things to yourself and see if it makes sense for your life and if it um, makes things better which i firmly believe that they do i mean it's just the proofs in the pudding when you put it to practice you know it's so interesting you're bringing this up because you're talking about intelligence Mm -hmm. and and i think we we have a serious problem with a lack of confidence all of us Mm -hmm. and i i know i undermine myself and my own intelligence and we should never ever do that because, like it says in the book, The Might of Thoughts, it is the nature of the thoughts that any conceivable thing can be brought into fruition. Mm-hmm. So if you have enough might and power of your thoughts, I mean, it's the universal creation law. It says thoughts that are enlivened by might and power will have an effect. And that effect is directly proportional to the might and power of the thought. So if you want to become more intelligent, if you want to become wiser, if you have thoughts of might and power, you can become as wise as anybody. So there's really no limitation. But you see, we're programmed with these negative. Mm-hmm. We're programmed to think we're not smart enough. We're programmed to have a lack of confidence. Look at how many things that you were programmed with as a child that were not true. Oh, my goodness. Uh, right. I think we have... Um, whole behavior patterns. Um, I, we I are find a society it, ill in its consciousness. I mean, yes. <laughs> They're out of control behavior patterns that we can't stop. Mm-hmm. And that's, I mean, most of my, like, I'm very interested in all the Meyer material, but most of the time in my daily life, what I'm doing is the stuff that's talked about in his book, um, in the Might of Thoughts book. And I am battling the negative thoughts. And I'm telling myself I'm confident, I'm optimistic, I'm cheerful, I'm relaxed. Uh, Even in Contact 215, it talks about, it has a section in there that talks about an optimistic attitude. It says, each person must first acquire an optimistic attitude solely for himself, and from this will initially result the progress of expansion through which his fellow man will be prompted and will join in. So when you develop and acquire an optimistic attitude, and I develop an optimistic attitude, it will spread. Mm -hmm. So that's the way this is going to spread. So that's what's going to make the change, the slow change that's going to take a while. 
But tell yourself you're cheerful, you're relaxed, you're enthusiastic, you're f enthusiastic, you're thankful that you're in harmony. Tell yourself, I, I tell yourself you persist, you persevere, you endure, you're calm, you're satisfied. You've read Dr. Lipton's book, right? I have, yes. I think that's great. I haven't even. I've, I've, I've watched. There is a YouTube that he did on a, show, a program that I think I've listened to every day for the past um, two or three months. It just, it has made me so aware of, of my own thinking and ways to improve my own thinking. Yes, I got your message. There were about three minutes to break, and then during that time I can see if my dog is bluffing or not. He's, he's <laughs> about 10 years old, and uh, it's a very interesting guy. It's a side tangent. Maybe we can fulfill in the last two minutes. So I was lucky enough to, to get him uh, prednisone, and he, he's got some kind of autoimmune problem. Yeah. Yep, there we go. There's some music. So we got five minutes, and uh, we'll be right back, folks. All right, I'm pause pause the recording, and uh, we got a five minute break, and I'll go ahead and take that break. I'll be back. Everybody can see the fair toast inside the 
Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome all of you back to Ohio Exopolitics. Uh, I'm your host, Mark Snyder. I've got Stephen Woods on the line, too. He's kind of working as a producer and kind of the co-host today. While chaos <laughs> reigns supreme in the background as we try to manage uh, our lives and our normal life in doing a uh, a two-hour show here, which is always challenging. I wanted to start um, the first 15 minutes. Uh, the, the, during the last hour, I'm going to talk about Billy's early life. A group called the Giza Intelligences, we're going to pick back up in the book, The Way to Live. And then we're going to talk about Atlantis. And um, first of all, Billy's spiritual experiences can be traced all the way back to a time when he was four years old. When he was growing up in a town called Niederflox in an area called Bulak in northern Switzerland. Uh, Bulak is a municipality in Switzerland in the canton of Zurich. It's located near what's called the Glatt Valley. And uh, as a young boy, at about 3 a.m. one morning, on a mild night in May in, in 1941, uh, Billy went outside and he sat down on a bench and he looked up at a starry sky. And he, he, he heard a voice in his head which said, My life is made out of the love of creation. And a short time later, he said something very interesting again. He said, since ancient times, you have lived among the stars. And he suddenly knew who he was and what his mission on the earth was. And he also said something that I puzzled about for quite some time that I haven't learned yet. He said, I suddenly knew about space and time what they signify concerning the evolution of human beings and all things. And this is a very interesting story about Billy's early, early lifetime. And it's called How It All Began. And I like to talk about Billy's early life because I think in many ways it, it coincides with most people in a way, uh, we're kind of spiritual children in comparison. Uh, so it, this occurred on February the 3rd, 1941, and Billy was, he was just four years old. And during this time, he lived ar around what's called the Eichen, Moser, and Bruder Mountains. And there were beautiful wide forests here and extensive meadows. And during this time, Billy had the urge to learn a lot. And he was kind of guided by a pastor 
named Rudolf Zimmerman, who was the minister of a Reformed church in the muni municipality of Bulak. And Billy said that uh, Pastor Rudolf Zimmerman played a weighty role in his life because Pastor Rudolf uh, Zimmerman had what Billy called um, an expression of knowledge and wisdom as well as kind of a true modesty to him. And he had a kindness to him and an appreciation in regard to human beings and life. And this was kind of a constant motivation for Billy. And he continued to contemplate and develop himself in that direction. So he kind of had a, a role model you could think of. Now we talked about reincarnation earlier. Now what you have to remember in this story about Billy's early life is that he's a human being on earth right now. He, he's just four years old. He has a material consciousness. He has a personality. Even though his spirit form is 9.6 billion years old, and it's been all these teachers before during this life, and I mean during this on his time on this earth. But he's he's been the teacher of these extraterrestrial humans called the Playaren in his previous life. One of the things Billy talks about from his very early age is that he learned to maintain his own trains of thought in a controlled manner to draw his own conclusion, and to make his own decisions. Now, this is critical, and I want the listener to think about this. You have to learn to maintain your own trains of thought. Now, what do I mean by that? You, Your thoughts shouldn't be jumping around all the time. That's one of the the, the aspects of controlling your thoughts is that they don't jump around all the time on different topics back and forth. I find myself doing that at times. You want to learn to control your thoughts so that you can maintain your thoughts in a control ma manner. Have a train, a train of thought. Now what this means is that and Billy talks about this in the Might of Thoughts book, is that you strengthen, you nurture, you strengthen and nurture your thoughts. You repeat your thoughts so that they become controlled and more valuable. And you will start to experience this. It has a great positive effect on your life when you start to be able to control your train of thought. So let me pick back up here with this story. It said, from a very early age, I learned to maintain my own trains of thought in a controlled manner, to draw my own conclusion, and to make my own decisions. That's very important. Independent thinking is what we're talking about. So Billy, as a four- or five-year-old boy, he's already an independent thinker. And he says something interesting next. He says, Through this I learned to separate the wheat from the chaff and to look for the truth where it is basically to be found. Now, he says next, The truth is found namely in one's own inner and innermost as well as in one's own intellect, in one's own reason, in one's own thoughts, in one's contemplation and feelings. So your th your the truth is found in your own thinking. You do not have to go outside of yourself to find the truth. The truth is within you. And that's what drives me crazy. Uh, Stephen, I think you're still with me. Okay. Um, what drives me crazy is this whole search for the... Um, the disclosure, the government disclosure. Why do we need a government disclosure? I don't, I, it's just astonishing. I do, you agree. Have any, do you have any thoughts on that? After reading the Meyer material, and, and why don't you tell us a little bit about the, your progression, because you probably progressed extremely quickly through this uh, in some ways, I would think. 
Well, I, I don't know uh, where everybody else is, you know, at in their learning or in their desire for it, but um, I stumbled across it uh, through the spiritual side of the teaching, not so much from uh, the UFO portion of it. Oh, so you, you, you didn't have the UFO experience and the exopolitics like I did, where that was my right. primary focus initially. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, oh, that's very interesting. Continue, sorry. Oh, that's okay. So for me to to, to get through that part of it, it was almost more difficult because I, I really resonated with the spiritual teaching, but the the UFO section of it, I had a real hard time with just for my own, you know, prior also, thoughts on, on the matter and stuff. So, 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 and, and you don't have to respond if anything's a little bit too personal. I, I don't like to get into people's personal things. Oh, but, sorry. Um, but you, you were a police officer for a while and usually police officers are pretty open to the UFO thing. Because, at least that's my understanding, because they see a lot of bizarre, bizarre stuff. Mm-hmm. But uh, but you never you never had that, right? Uh, well, it's not that I was closed-minded to it. It's just that uh, most of the people I dealt with that were into that were, were we? unfortunately mentally uh, <laughs> uh, affected. You know, I'm just being honest. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, so... They weren't that, right. <laughs> well, yeah, they're a little... They're, Bubbles a little off plum usually. So. <laughs> well, uh, I would agree with that, uh, and and that's the one thing I've noticed is that um, if you have a focus for the truth, it will put you at odds with society in general. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, because the last thing I want to do is be controversial, but I find myself involved in, in, in controversy. And, um, yeah, so you never, you never had the whole UFO thing that, that you, that was even an impediment to the story for you. It, it was kind of, yeah. Wow. So from just, your and, perspective, you would like throw this away. I mean, I don't want to, you know, stupid UFO stuff, right? Well, it was muddying up the waters for me because yeah. I really liked what he was talking about spiritually, but all the other gray area and that and all the uh, men in black stuff and people, you know, messing with his information. It, it was just very hard for me to get through. No kidding. So probably yeah. even the historical stuff is probably a problem as well. I find it interesting. No, I, I do. I find that very interesting. But when it talks about, you know, uh, uh, the Giza intelligences and things, like I find that. that interesting too. I mean, I, it's not that I don't find it interesting, but when people started bringing up, um, uh, well, take the Ascot photos, you know, for instance. And, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And how, you know, I can understand how those things could be adulterated by humans. I, I get that. Yeah. But looking at evidence, you know, that's my old job. And it, it just brings up all these questions that you have to work through. And it just, it, huh. it slowed things down for me. That's so interesting. Yeah. Uh, I, I came from that whole uh, perspective, but I think I always was interested in, in the spiritual stuff. But um, one thing that I noticed from as I learned this material deeper and deeper and deeper is, and I've talked about this many times, is cognitive dissonance mm-hmm. that I would experience. And it's hard for me to put in words, but it's almost like looking at the sun. It's so bright, it's hurting in my eyes, and I, I, I just have to look away. And then that was like the experience of studying the Meyer information, particularly in the spiritual stuff. Because, like, you know, I'm looking back at the sun and saying, like, whoa, this is hurting my eyes. I mean, I, I need to look away just to kind of gather myself. But that's the experience of the cognitive dissonance that I that I was having. You've experienced something like that, too, right? Well, yeah, as soon as you start dismantling these things that you've held as truths for your life, and one by one, as each one of these things topple, or you can you know, overcome it with new information, that's difficult. Well, can you name any off the top of your head that were uh, the whole con- the whole concept of God, heaven, hell? Um, uh, you know, you're a sinner, you know. Uh, wait, but but you you were involved in that though in religion oh, yeah. for a while, right? But you still were having issue with that. Oh sure, yeah. Interesting. I was seeing this thing. Uh, oh, I wish I could remember the name of the movie. You know Keanu Reeves. Um, Matrix or something. It's it, well, the Matrix is a great movie, but this one was 
This one was about a guy who's on earth here and he has the ability to see angels and demons and mm-hmm. you know it's a very religious overtones and uh, you know he he can literally go back into hell and it's just it's it's very bizarre. So uh you can find that up on YouTube if you're interested in it. But I do think a lot of these concepts are very, very um unhealthy because they they create roadblocks in our thinking. Mm-hmm. Particularly in recognizing our own abilities. You know, we were talking about confidence before wasn't it you who mentioned confidence and the lack of confidence or the lack of or not feeling intelligent enough or something like that yeah if you held a belief that you know you weren't intelligent or you're not college material type thing it would prevent right. you from going to school and right oh yeah 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 um you know in my field in in the computer in software industry huh, your intellect is constantly being uh challenged and that's what i face every day okay uh, am I going to make this a deadline? Am I smart enough to get this to work <laughs> in the next three or four days? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and uh, what I'm doing now, like we're down, like there's been a shuffling around and the company, the company is incredibly uh, doing incredibly well. But uh, what usually happens or what has happened a lot is like they'll throw me on the latest, whatever the fire is. I get thrown in the fire or whatever it is. So the fire right now is configuration, so I've never done it before. So I'm configuring this very complicated application, and I come up, you know, continually with things. God, I just don't know the answer to this, so I have to go find people to do or try to research it or, or whatever. But what I find is that people that are have true wisdom and true intelligence are very humble. Mm-hmm. They're not. They're not arrogant at all, because they've been through this whole process. But 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 what you're saying is very very true in that if you don't have uh, enough confidence in your own intellect, and I think this is probably, you know, in the affirmation thing that I that I talk about over and over again, because this is what I do every day i mean this is exactly how i fight my negative programming is the first thing i always tell me myself is i'm confident and so i have a feeling of trust in my own abilities and qualities and judgment and a feeling of Mm self-assurance arising from my appreciation of my own ability or qualities now why didn't religion teach us that Good question. Wouldn't that have been wonderful if it would teach us that? But what did religion teach us? Not confidence in yourself, did it? Oh, right. Exactly. And not to question anything, because if you did, I mean, if you're reading the wrong book, I mean, it's, uh, you know, forbidden. <laughs> you know, you're, you're, uh, the devil is going to get you if you read that book. Or... <laughs> right. You know, even in Sloth's explanations, there's a section here. On confidence. Let me read this real quick. Uh, to that end, his entire work and all action also contribute, as also do manner and responsibility. How he confronts his obligations and the fulfillment of obligations and how he lives. And Sloth next tells Billy, you must build up great confidence for all of your future and for all the success of your works, your tasks, your job, and your mission. And always know that you will accomplish everything and never fail. Why aren't we teaching our kids that? Wouldn't that be wonderful if you taught your kids that mm-hmm. always know that you will accomplish everything and never fail? That's what we should be teaching our kids, right? Because you don't make a good uh, subservient slave with that mentality. <laughs> I think you have a point there. Mm-hmm. So the Meyer information is not teaching you to be a sheep. No. It's teaching you to have confidence. And let me continue here. It says, and only if you maintain the correctness of your thoughts and feelings, 
as well as your work and your actions in every respect and always use your great powers of consciousness in this form, you will be able to have true confidence in yourself and not allow this to be shaken by anything. Now, isn't that wonderful? It is wonderful. <laughs> if you could have a true confidence, you know? Go ahead. It was like, uh, I can't remember the gal's name that you had on from Colorado, but uh, where she said that we're, we got to grow up. You wow. know, because so many people, if you're in that mindset, you're like a child. And we have to take responsibility for ourselves. Are you talking about like a religious mindset? Right. You know, but they, they, they keep you as a child, basically. You know, you, you don't take responsibility for your actions. You know that Dr. Bruce Lipton said that the the Jesuits, I guess it's one order of the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. they knew if they had a child for the first seven years of his life, they could program him to follow the church. How and true is that, though? Boy. Uh, it is very true, and I just feel quite lucky that I got out of that programming because I was involved in that to a degree. So anyway, uh, let me read this last one. This is um, line 175 or 177 here. Uh, Therefore, acquire confidence and the certainty that you will always maintain control, whereby you shall not, however, behave in a way which does not correspond to your nature, because the human being shall see and recognize that you are a human being as are they themselves? So anyway, I mean, it, it, I was really surprised to see this section on confidence in Swath's explanations. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, in this material, unbelievable. I mean, you just find stuff all over the place. Go ahead. Oh, I'm, no, I'm just agreeing with you. It, uh, the nuggets of wisdom are all over the place. They're everywhere. And uh, I, I read it a lot, and I'm kind of not paying the attention that I should. I mean, it's, it's like I know there, there are times when it's, when it's not going in so well mm -hmm. for some reason. Uh, so I wanted to, we talked about Billy's early life. And in this next stage, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Giza intelligences. And to really talk about that, just I'll cover it briefly. The Meyer material says that there are human beings all over our universe. And many of these very advanced human beings came out of a different space-time configuration. I was talking about the creation earlier. And our material belt has seven different space-time configurations. And the extraterrestrials that came to the Earth in the very, very ancient past came out of a different space-time configuration. And many of them came from Lyra Vega, uh, or their ancestors were from Lyra Vega. So I'm going back into the history here. I'm going to get in the UFO stuff, um, Stephen, so hopefully that won't be too challenging for you. But No, no, I've, I've gotten over that. I, I find it interesting. But yeah. <laughs> okay, good. So uh, back in Contact Report 9, which is very bizarre, and I, I recommend people... Take a look at Contact Report 9. It, and I'm going to open that in the background here. But there's a guy named Pelagon. And um, this also, it's talked about in Contact Report 59. And Pelagon was what's called an Ishwish, a king of wisdom. And hopefully I'll get connect this with the Giza intelligences, but these all these stories are so interesting. And he was from a different space-time configuration. Okay. He, I believe, lived on the world that we call Era, where the Pleiaran are supposedly from. And I think this was about 150,000 years ago. And Pelagon, he fled from era and he elected himself leader and he took about seven seventy thousand human beings and they went in these great spaceships and they fled and they i think they were they were on era at this time and era was i mean the playaron were still in their 
beginning stages. I don't think he was from Lyra Vega. I could be wrong. But he brought his group through space and time and made a wild escape to the Earth. And he did this on a stolen spaceship, okay? Now, he was a pretty good guy generally, but, but they were fighting for their life. And they he had 200 very good scientists underneath him. And uh, Pelagon was elected unanimously as their leader, their king in wisdom and their leader. And they, they lived on Earth. They came here 150,000 years ago, and they built up many great cities. So I think it's very interesting if you... If you go and I was watching it last night, the ancient aliens stuff. Have you ever you probably do you ever watch that or is that too weird for you? I've watched a couple episodes. I can't say I've watched a whole lot, no. Okay, okay. Well, it's extremely interesting. Um, one of the things they were talking last night, uh, something called uh, the the dropa in China, and. They found hundreds of these metal discs in China, in, 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 in particular caves, and they have like this hole in, in the center. And there's engraving in the center of this uh, disc. And there was a scientist slash archaeologist in China who was able to decipher that hieroglyphics, and it tells this whole story about these people called the Dropa that came to the earth and landed in China and went in these caves. And uh, the story is that they found all of these Dropa discs as well as these very small skeletons of these people. And this is kind of a way big tangent because this isn't had anything to do with about Pelagon. <laughs> but um, the Dropa, all of this information has been documented about how they, and that story that's written on the inside of these discs is about how the people got here and how they crest landed their ship and, and they were living in China for a while. And all of this information was confiscated by the Chinese government uh, and kind of hidden away. Well, enough was written about it and enough photographs were taken is the information is kind of still out there. So, our history, what I'm telling you, the reason I got off on this, is our history, our true history, is very, very different from mm -hmm. what has been passed on. And this whole thing with Pelagon happened 150,000 years ago. So, and a lot of these gigantic structures that were built were uh, built maybe with the help of Earth humans, but... Uh, the the architectural work and the equipment to build these, I believe, came from these people like Pelagon and these 70,000 people that he brought to the earth. And they came from um, the Playaren. You know, if you go to the Pleiades and then you go 80 light years beyond our Pleiades into a different space-time configuration, that's where they, they lived. And... Um, if you go to Contact Report 9, it's very, if you go out to the Future of Mankind site, you can read about Contact Report 9. And this was happened on Friday, Friday the 21st, uh, 1975 at 4.18 p.m. And Semyase was telling Billy about Earth history. I'm probably not going to get to the Giza intelligences too much here because I'm kind of running out of time. But Semyase said 70,000 human beings fled under the leadership of Pelagon. And, um, and they, they took this spacecraft. They fled through the cosmos. He had 200 leaders and sub-leaders. He was the king of wisdom. And through thousands of years on the earth, they constructed great cities and inhabited uh, all the continents of Earth. And this went well for about 10,000 years. And finally, there was a great war. And only a few thousand human beings survived this war. And they fled once again into the cosmos. And they left the Earth. And it says here, for 7,000 years, none returned to the Earth. And the humans left behind degenerated. And they became very, very wild. 
And I'll just leave it at this now. We'll come back to it at the end of the show when I talk about Atlantis. So what happened a lot of times, there were these great wars. uh, Society fell backwards. Some people fled the earth. And the humans left behind degenerated. And they became very vulnerable to these um, Giza intelligences. And we'll pick up there. But I wanted to get back just for a short time about the way to live uh, and this duty to self. And if these people maybe that were on the earth in the ancient past would have known more about the spiritual teaching like this, or if they would have followed it, they, they may not have destroyed themselves. So really that's what we're talking about here. Uh, is keeping from destroying ourselves. Uh, did you get a chance to pay a whole lot of attention uh, last show, what I was talking about? Wasn't it the last show I talked a little bit about population? Oh, yeah. Um, that's very interesting stuff, isn't it? Yeah, it's a huge issue for us to deal with as humanity. You know, they've got another gigantic fire on the West Coast. Um, biggest one in history for California. I don't even know what they're calling it. I haven't been following it this year. But but it's all tied into overpopulation and the destruction of the earth. What we're what we're dealing with here in in the in the Meyer teaching is keeping from destroying ourselves, which we've done in, in history past. Do you have any comment on any of that? I'm kind of long winded. Oh, that's okay. Uh just back in the train up just a little bit. Why sure. do you think they chose Earth? I think the earth is really good real estate, man. I think we have uh, just, we're like a garden. We have the most fantastic place to live here. And I think a lot of the places, and this is speculation, a lot of, the, a lot of other worlds where you can survive, but it is not this nice. And we're taking a garden planet and we're turning it into a desert. What we're doing is ghastly. Mm. Horrific. Um, any comment? Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering too if if they were fleeing and and let's say that you'd have a pursuer after you. Mm-hmm. I wonder if the location of our planet in the universe had something to do with them picking this place because if they were being pursued, you'd want to go somewhere that you can't be found. I would have to think. Or, wow, or, that is very good point. That's extremely good point. Continue. Yeah, so it's just making me think as to you know the the original purpose of coming here. I mean, it, it's a habitable planet, obviously, but um, I wonder if there's just more to that. Oh, I think there's a lot to that because if you think about our solar system, um, especially the outer solar system, and all the rocks and the debris and the meteors, it's got to be hard to get through. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, because they're they're mentioning that they came from another time and space configuration, know, too. configuration. But you know, why mention that? Why is that important? I think that's important, and I think part of what you're saying is they were coming, they were leaving their own space-time configuration, right? Like to, yeah, exactly. They were fleeing to throw, right, to get totally out of the picture from where their old dimension was. Exactly, and that that reminds me of uh, remember the whole story about the Cirrus system, and a lot of the people on the Earth are descendants of those from the Cirrus system. The genetically manipulated people remember that whole thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that and they fled too. They came here, and they were fleeing. And I found another little bit of tidbit of information this week that, you know, at one time, and and I'm sure you remember this. There were three planets in our solar system, and I don't care. We'll just go off on a tangent. Um, <laughs> the whole rest of the show will be the tangent, probably. But there were three, three worlds that were inhabitable in our solar system. Mm-hmm. There was Earth, there was Mars, and there was a third world, which I'm forgetting the name of right now. Malona. Malona, thank you. Sometimes it's called Malona Phaeton as well. And it was a bigger planet uh, than, than the Earth. Well, the Mars is only like one-third of the size of Earth. And one of the things I learned this week is that if we, were, if we stay on Mars, we'll lose much of the bone density that we have now. 
Mm. A lot of it. So once you go to Mars and you start living on Mars, I'm not so sure you can. It becomes very difficult to come back to the Earth because of, of the loss of bone density. And I remember it in Contact 251. They talked about the people that fled during these disasters, fled from Mars. They just threw it out real quickly, and they said they had to make certain adjustments or certain, something like that because I think they had to do something to their skeleton. It reminds me of what the, the Lyrians must have had to go through because they seem to be giants coming here. Yes. So how did that affect them? You know, I have no idea. You know, I really don't know. The whole idea of people being much, much bigger is also another very, very interesting side tangent uh, that, that we could go on because, man, you know, some of these people, and I think it's in Contact Report 9, which I was just looking at, they talk about people, I forget how many meters they said, but it would be the equivalent of like 30 plus feet tall i can't even i can't even imagine that but see the bible even talks about that too so i mean here you have all these other sources of information that are confirming the same thing oh yeah oh yeah the and i have all these names and sometimes i don't like these terminologies that we have from the bible but mm -hmm. uh, some of these i guess in the bible were 10 or 12 feet tall but they were bigger they were bigger than that. And they also had tremendous appetites. And I think some of them would eat people. Right. I mean, smaller people. <laughs> this is like a, you know, like a chicken wing or something. I'm just going to pick this person up and eat him. Now, think of, and this is another strand. This is my mind. It's twisted. Uh, think about that. The most, um, like if you, if you wanted to really... Um, like, say you're antagon antagonistic with someone, okay, and someone you really dislike. To me, the most degrading thing you could do would be to eat them. I know that sounds weird. <laughs> but think about that. I'm going to, not only am I going to kill you, I'm going to eat your body. And then in a few hours or days, I will just defecate you. And you will be just a memory. Now, think about that. Now, I think about that in terms of the creation. And I I just wonder about this whole predator-prey relationship. Mm -hmm. I wish Billy would comment on that because to me that is the most strange thing. The whole predator-prey thing. You know what I'm saying? Well, in a sense, he kind of has. If he's saying that we're the at the beginning level, well, then perhaps there's some things that aren't perfected yet. No kidding. Right. No kidding. Yeah. That whole situation. And um, it's also very interesting when you think of, uh, you know, going back 150,000 years, we were talking about Pelagon, but going back 150,000 years to people that were much more advanced technologically than we are now. Isn't that humbling? Mm -hmm. Now, it were is, people here before Pelagon? Yeah, going back millions of years. They don't talk okay. too much about them, but they say that in the southwest of the United States, millions of years ago, people were here that had wars, nuclear conflicts. Mm -hmm. That's why we have no. Death, Death Valley and the other valley, Fire Valley, I think they call it, or whatever. Go ahead. Were they related to the uh, Playaros or no? Or I don't I really Lyrians? don't know. I, well, they were probably distant related to the people from Lyra Vega in some ways. So we've had such a dumbed-down view of our history, haven't we? It's just astonishing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that to me, uh, and one of my big fascinations is, is with the Meyer information related to our history. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's interesting, because if you get a good handle on our history our religions would go away. Literally, mm. they would go away. Uh, well, there would be a fight, but, um, you know, and I, I've talked a million times about the letter J and, you know, how there couldn't have been 
Now, I'm not saying there wasn't a great teacher named Emmanuel or Iesus or Jesus or whatever, but he absolutely wasn't called Jesus. Be, I mean, now, I have to get reality checks, you know, and isn't that astonishing? We have, mm-hmm. I mean, millions of people, hundreds of millions of people, billions of people, and I didn't even know until about four or five years ago that that just go along with this teaching about a person for not only Jesus, but James and John and Job and Jeremiah. And they were all, they all had different names because there was no, there was no letter J in the, in the, in the Greek or the Hebrew or the Aramaic of, of the Bible. And we consider that, you know, can you imagine doing a translation and just changing someone's name? Isn't that absurd? Mm-hmm. Uh, to me, um, it just, I just, it leaves me speechless. I just, I be, this was one of the biggest shocking points to me is learning, you know, because uh, we talk about Emmanuel in, in the Meyer information. And I was always like, Emmanuel, how can that be right? I mean, come on. You know, I, I had to compartmentalize that whole section in my mind because this is what I do. Do you ever do this? Like if you get something you don't really understand and it seems to contradict a whole bunch of stuff, I don't just throw it out. I just kind of put it in a drawer in my mind or a place and I kind of wait and I think about more of it later. And I think that's a good thing for people to do. They should do that more often rather than just throwing things out. I think the quote is, uh, be open-minded yet skeptical. If you're open-minded and not skeptical, you believe everything, which isn't good. And if you're closed-minded and, and uh, not skeptical, then you're know-it-all and you won't ever learn anything new. Yeah, and you can really cut yourself off from very, very important information. They have a very positive uh effect on your life but let me continue here Mm -hmm. Um, I was getting to talk about the way to live and I've already burned up that whole section of time so I wanted to get it back to the Atlantis and Lemuria and what I'll do probably in the next 15 minutes as I talk about this is just really set the stage for some of this Um, because in Contact Report 9 it talks about Atlantis in Mu and these people and this is on the earth you know we talked about Pelagon 150,000 years ago now we're talking about 130,000 years ago or so where two cities were built two huge cities were built on separate continents and for thousands of years these two civilizations lived in friendship and peace and eventually which I always thought was interesting is that the scientists had the old thirst for might and power and tried to seize the government. You know, I don't see our scientists as being that way. Do you see our scientists on Earth now being that way? Um, I guess I just don't have enough information on that for myself to make a educated yeah. guess. But. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. It says here, however, after having tired of the wars, this time the nations rose up against them, and so they occupied spaceships and fled into cosmic space, that being some 15,000 years ago in Earth chronology. And for, so this, for two millenniums, they and their descendants lived in a neighboring solar system. In two millenniums, during which they had become very evil, 2,000 years, this group, they only maintained order under the strictest control. By mutations in their scientists, they extended their lifespans for thousands of years. So these are the people that left Earth. And, and right now we have Atlantis and Mu, two civilizations on Earth of extraterrestrial humans. And we're talking about the group that left the earth. They became very evil. 
and they maintained order. But they had a tyranny, and they had mut- mutations, and their scientists extended their lifespans for thousands of years. Now, this is, you know, I, I would love to be able to extend my lifespan. I, you know, maybe it's because I don't know enough yet, but the idea of living for thousands of years is somewhat appealing to me. So anyway, overcome by the thirst for power, they left their home world and about, okay, now this says 13,000 years ago, they returned to the earth. Now, I'm not sure of that time. Maybe it was 13,000 years ago. And their highest leader was a guy named Eris, who was referred to as the barbarian. And it says here, much like the Ish wishes of 40,000 years before him, he also had 200 leaders and sub-leaders uh, who were the scientists. They were competent in their scientific fields. In two groups, they settled in the high north. Okay. In the present Florida of North America today. Now, this is very confusing. They settled in the high north Well, before our planet was shifted on its axis, Florida was in the high north. I know that may come as a shock. People do not, would not agree with that. But these, this group led by Eris lived in Florida. And and Florida at that time was what we call Hyperborea. And the earth was very different. It wasn't tilted on its axis. North was very warm, too, very warm up there, a very uh, fantastic climate. And these groups, this group, Eris, continuously started attacking Atlantis and Mu in wars. And during only the first few millenniums after their occupation of Earth began, they succeeded in destroying, uh, they really got the destruction of Atlantis and Mu. Uh, Stephen, you had something about the Nazis? Oh, that's that's a good point. Yeah, the Nazis. Continue. I just thought that they utilize a lot of scientists. I mean, I'm not an expert on that by any means, but uh, they seem to be pretty fascinated with science and uh, the occult stuff. I um, I must admit, I have a great. Um, I would like to go back to the time of World War II, and to be able to observe what really happened. Um, Were the Nazis really as cruel and evil as they're depicted? Um, How far were they really in their technology? Uh, Because, you know, um, not only did Werner von Braun come from Germany, also his mentor, Dr. Hermann Oberth, and Dr. Herman Oberth, in a meeting in 1970, talked about, uh, he said, we cannot, take, um, we cannot take credit for our scientific advances alone because we've been helped by people of other worlds. Now, mm-hmm. he said that. You can listen to that on the Internet. That, to me, is enough to prove the whole thing. I mean, when you have a scientist like that. But they had, they developed... The, the first real jet fighter, the ME-262, which was an incredible airplane. They also had another fighter that never, it got a prototype developed. Have you ever heard of the HO-229? No. It is a, it looks like the B-2. Exactly. Hmm. The Germans built something that was almost a B-2, but it wasn't a bomber. It was really a heavy fighter. What they had it for, it was a flying wing. Um, It had heavy cannons on the front, uh, a tremendous airplane. They also had a prototype of another jet fighter, which was called the Volks something, the People's Fighter or something. Very maneuverable. Anyway, I wonder who were the... Who were the real bad guys of World War II? Was it really Germany? Um, what we've been taught is yes, and maybe that in fact is the truth. And we talk, we hear about the 
how many of the Jews were were murdered in the concentration camps, and was was some of that exaggerated? I mean, I, I don't know, but I just find it very odd that this one small little country in Europe developed so many incredible technologies, probably technologies we don't even know about yet today. Mm. And then we took all of their scientists after World War II and brought them, you know, the Russians got a group, we got a group here. Um, I just wonder if we even really know our own recent history about what (laughs) happened. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I really wonder, I mean, who... We were the ones that dropped the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Nobody else dropped any atomic bombs. We were the ones Mm -hmm. that dropped the atomic bombs. Oh, and then you can say, oh, well, they didn't didn't develop it yet. Oh, they didn't? Okay, maybe that's true. I don't know. Um, But, you know, who was really the bad guy here? I I mean, uh, one little country germany you know you know if you take ohio indiana michigan put them together that's probably the size of germany that little country is fighting the whole freaking world it's fighting the russians it's fighting uh great britain france poland the united states who's really the bad guy here you know um, I mean, I'm not trying to make it great. You know, maybe they were as evil as people say. I, I don't know, but it just makes me wonder. Have you ever had thoughts like that? Or? Um, I, I haven't studied that enough to know. No. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I understand. Hitler. You know Hitler was against hunting? Because no. he, had a great, he had a great love of nature, and he had a great love of animals. And he thought it was unethical to kill animals for sport. Now, that doesn't sound like the thoughts of an of a crazy man to me. Now, I'm not saying he didn't lose it and that he wasn't, you know, uh, uh, a monster, but there's something about this story that isn't right. You know, let's look at what the fire bombings of Dresden and Hamburg. I guess it's hundreds of thousands of people incinerated in firebombing. You know, we were the ones that were, those weren't military targets. We were bombing civilians. Why? Why did we do that? You know, anyway, I'm ranting. But when it comes to not knowing about history, my goodness, you know, here I'm talking about ancient civilizations in Atlantis and Mu. I'm not so sure we even know what really happened in World War II. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, I agree. You know? I mean, it's a fascinating... I have a... You know, I'm running out of time here. We've only got like seven minutes left, or probably less than that, right? We don't even know what's going on in today's world, let's be honest. Yeah, we don't know what's going on in today's world. <laughs> you know, but I can I can rant and rave about this for quite some time. Um, I don't even know what's going on in my own government right now. You know, Billy talks about 2020, this, the, the beginning of the destruction of our government. You know, with what I'm seeing now, this whole thing about Russian collusion, which is so weird that I can't believe I'm even... I feel like I'm in the Twilight Zone. Remember that movie, The Twilight <laughs> oh, <yeah>. Zone? <laughs> Da, 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 da. That that was like a, you know, I don't know when was that in the sixties or the seventies that show was on the old oh, yeah. and white, Rod Serling, Welcome to the Twilight. I feel like we're living in the Twilight Zone. <laughs> I, I I see this stuff on the news and I'm like, I can't believe I'm hearing this. This is total nonsense. You know, this is uh, um, uh, made up stuff. At least from my perspective. So. Anyway, yeah, uh, I don't know how we're doing. You probably not haven't had the chance to look at our time. I know we're uh, it's about six minutes to go. Do we end right on the on the dot there, or do we end? Uh, Pretty much, yeah. Uh, so we end right at six. Yep. That's when the music starts. Uh, about a minute, minute two, yeah. A minute, minute or two before six. So, gosh, we've we're, we're I was talking about Atlantis, and I've been talking about. 
uh, Billy's writings, The Way to Live. I talked about reincarnation and creation and the creation of natural laws. And I talked a little bit about the might of thoughts, which I think is the most important thing. And I talked about Billy's early life. And I, I meant to get on the Giza intelligences, but once I got on history, I kind of bounce around a bit because there's a lot there, uh, a lot of very interesting stuff. Um, are you, what, what's your focus right now, Stephen? Are you like reading the mind of thoughts or? Uh... Yeah, I've been, I've been on a tangent of looking into consciousness related things. So I, uh, watched some of Figo Canada's, uh, stuff on that and then reading some other books, uh, just trying to go down that tangent of consciousness right now. So, what what, what did Figu Canada have? Anything interesting? Oh, uh, consciousness in the spirit form. So I went through all the shows that he had on that, and you know, uh, what is it? You know, uh, and some of the links I sent to you before, just uh, what so they're finding they in science today, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Which I think is very, very interesting. Like uh, where Doctor Bruce Lipton talks about transplants. I'm kind of going off on, you know, a different topic here because we've only got two or three minutes. I can't even begin to start on this whole Atlantis thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's the music right there. There's the show, man. All right. You've been listening to Ohio Exopolitics. I'm your host, Mark Snyder, and I guess my my co-host today has been Stephen Wood, and we're talking about the incredible Meyer information. We'll talk to you later. Have a good day.